Bible reading. But before we read, shall we just have a moment of prayer? Father, we're asking that you will open our eyes of understanding as we read your word today. We're asking that relevant passages that really speak to our present needs and problems, spiritually and physically and materially, you will impress upon our hearts. Be with us, enlighten us, instruct us, teach us as we read together now. In Jesus' name, I pray. We'll continue with the reading now. The Book of the Prophet Isaiah The Book of the Prophet Isaiah 
Chapter 22. Chapter 22. The Burden of the Valley of Vision. What aileth thee now that thou art wholly gone up to the housetops? Thou that art full of stirs, a tumultuous city, a joyous city. Thy slain men are not slain with the sword, nor dead in battle. All thy rulers are fled together. They are bound by the archers. All that are found in thee are bound together, which have fled from far. Therefore, said I, look away from me. I will weep bitterly. Labor not to comfort me because of the spoiling of the daughter of my people. For it is a day of trouble and of treading down and of perplexity by the Lord God of hosts in the valley of vision, breaking down the walls and of crying to the mountains. And Elam bare the quiver with chariots of men and horsemen, and Kerr uncovered the shield. And it shall come to pass that thy choicest valleys shall be full of chariots, and the horsemen shall set themselves in array at the gate. And he discovered the covering of Judah, and thou didst look in that day to the armor of the house of the forest. Ye have seen also the breaches of the city of David, that they are many, and ye gathered together the waters of the lower pool. And ye have numbered the houses of Jerusalem, and the houses have ye broken down to fortify the wall. Ye made also a ditch between the two walls for the water of the old pool. But ye have not looked unto the maker thereof, neither had respect unto him that fashioned it long ago. And in that day did the Lord God of hosts call to weeping, and to mourning, and to baldness, and to girding with sackcloth. And behold joy and gladness, slaying oxen and killing sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. And it was revealed in mine ears by the Lord of hosts, Surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till ye die, saith the Lord God of hosts. Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Go, get thee unto this treasurer, even unto Shebna, which is over the house, and say, What hast thou here, and whom hast thou here, that thou hast hewed thee out a sepulchre here? as he that heweth him out a sepulchre on high, and that graveth an habitation for himself in a rock. Behold, the Lord will carry thee away with a mighty captivity, and will surely cover thee. He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. There shalt thou die, and there the chariots of thy glory shall be the shame of thy Lord's house. And I will drive thee from thy station, and from thy state shall he pull thee down. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. And I will clothe him with thy robe, and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to the house of Judah." And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house, and they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue, all vessels of small quantity, from the vessels of cups even to all the vessels of flagons. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in the sure place be removed, and be cut down, and fall, and the burden that was upon it shall be cut off, for the Lord hath spoken it. Chapter 23 The Burden of Tyre Howl, ye ships of Tarshish, for it is laid waste, so that there is no house, no entering in, from the land of Chittim it is revealed to them. Be still, ye inhabitants of the isle, thou whom the merchants of Zidon that pass over the sea have replenished, and by great waters the seed of Sihor, the harvest of the river, is her revenue, and she is a mart of nations. Be thou ashamed, O Zidon, for the sea hath spoken, even the strength of the sea, saying, I travail not, nor bring forth children, neither do I nourish up young men, nor bring up virgins. As at the report concerning Egypt, so shall they be sorely pained at the report of Tyre. Pass ye over to Tarshish, 
How, ye inhabitants of the isle, is this your joyous city whose antiquity is of ancient days? Her own feet shall carry her afar off to sojourn. Who hath taken this counsel against Tyre, the crowning city, whose merchants are princes, whose traffickers are the honorable of the earth? The Lord of hosts hath purposed it, to stain the pride of all glory, and to bring into contempt all the honorable of the earth. Pass through thy land as a river, O daughter of Tarshish, there is no more strength. He stretched out his hand over the sea, he shook the kingdoms. The Lord hath given a commandment against the merchant city, to destroy the strongholds thereof. And he said, Thou shalt no more rejoice, O thou oppressed virgin, daughter of Zidon. Arise, pass over to Chittim, there also shalt thou have no rest. Behold the land of the Chaldeans. This people was not, till the Assyrian founded it for them, that dwell in the wilderness. They set up the towers thereof, they raised up the palaces thereof, and he brought it to ruin. Howl, ye ships of Tarshish, for your strength is laid waste. And it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten seventy years, according to the days of one king. After the end of seventy years shall Tyre sing as an harlot. Take an harp, go about the city, thou harlot that hast been forgotten. Make sweet melody, sing many songs that thou mayest be remembered. And it shall come to pass after the end of seventy years that the Lord will visit Tyre, and she shall turn to her hire, and shall commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. And her merchandise and her hire shall be holiness to the Lord. It shall not be treasured nor laid up, for her merchandise shall be for them that dwell before the Lord, to eat sufficiently and for durable clothing." You have just listened to the Bible reading, and we need to take whatever we have learned to the Lord in prayer. Will you all rise up, please? Talk to the Lord in prayer. You've seen a commandment, a warning, an example, an instruction to obey, a promise to claim. Pray for grace that you will do as you have learned in the word of God. In Jesus' name, we pray. Fear would never 
find you in our eyes. All the loneliness was something you'd never have to fight. But I did say, I'll be right there by side. And I did say. Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for showing us your own way. 
the more excellent way. We're asking, Lord, your plant, establish your love, divine love, in our hearts so that in everything we do, whether in the church or outside the church, in our communities, in our families, anywhere we find ourselves, this agape love, God's kind of love, will be in every heart, every moment, every time, in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, we'll never forget that whatever we offer in service, if it's devoid of love, is not acceptable in your sight. Therefore, Lord, we pray that every time our heart will be influenced and controlled by your love in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, every time, in everything we do, to have the more excellent way before us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, God bless you. You can see now today we're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And we're reading from verse 1 all through to verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. And then in verse 2 it says, And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Then in verse 3, it says, Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Today, we're looking at those verses of Scripture, and we're titling the message today, The Preeminence of God's Love in the Heart. The love of God, not just in the mind. The love of God, not just in our understanding. The love of God, not just in our memory. That is, we can quote it from the Bible. But the Lord, by grace, after saving us, after purifying us, after circumcising our heart, after taking away the old Adamic nature out of the earth, he implants the heaven kind of love, not human love, not erotic love, not society love, not the kind of love we hear about, love you, love me, a syndrome, not that one, the love that comes from heaven and come from the very heart of God and by the operation of the grace of God that love is implanted in our hearts that is the preeminent thing above whatever we offer above whatever we serve above whatever we give above, above our talent above our skill above the possibilities of human learning that love in the heart influencing everything we do controlling everything we do and impacting everything we do that in the sight of god is what is profitable and rewardable and it's preeminent that means it's not just that you have it once in a while, all through your life, in everything and every way that comes to the top, that comes to the limelight, that in your life, what is noticed is not just your ability, but the love, the God kind of love that you manifest in everything you do. I pray God will help us to understand that without love, all else is vain in our lives. 
the preeminence of God's love in the heart. There are three things we're considering as we look at the message today. Number one, the priority of charity, God's love in the heart. The priority. The one we need to give the first place to and the first attention to and the one we need to examine our heart anything we're doing anywhere we are that this is the number one this is the premier thing this is the first thing this is the priority of all our actions of all our lifestyle the priority of charity God's love in the heart number two the purposelessness of charisma the purposelessness of ability and strength and skill and all zeal and excitement the purposelessness of charisma without love in the heart I'm sure you understand if we're going to make progress in our personal lives what we do must be on purpose and if it is going to be appreciated by God recognized by God rewarded by God it must have the purpose of love you serve I serve we serve that service to be profitable and rewardable when we get to heaven or even here on earth must have love as the basis love as the foundation love as the motivation of that that we're doing otherwise there's no purpose or for that action the purposelessness of charisma without love in the heart number three is the preference of christ-likeness with love in our heart what we prefer is that we'll be christ-like every time that the life we live will be centered on the life of Christ. Everything he did, he did it in love. And then the supreme love of going to the cross and dying for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting love and that love motivated him that love is to made him to go to calvary and to do everything that he did he removed mountains because of love he healed the sick because of love he delivered the oppressed because of love he rebuked the peter and those other people that rebuked because of love he warned people because of love he proclaimed the good news the gospel because of love everything he did he did in love if we are christ-like will do everything we do because of love the preference of christ likeness with love in our hearts let's come to number one that's the priority of charity god's love in the heart first corinthians chapter 13 reading from verse one first corinthians 13 verse one though i speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity i am become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal isn't it instructive that paul the apostle did not say though you corinthians speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity you are become a sounding brass or a tinkling symbol he said do i as an apostle do i as a fervent zealous preacher do i traveling here and traveling there and i even speak in the tongues of men and in the tongues of angels and if i have not as an apostle as a preacher as a prophet as a as a pastor as a teacher of the word of god as a worker as a minister if i have not charity i 
Paul the Apostle, I the preacher, I the pastor, and become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. We look at three things here. Number one, the possession of charity, God's love in a pure heart. Number two, the primacy of God's love with a purposeful heart. Number three, the perception of charity, God's love in a peaceful heart. Love does not dwell in a pugnacious fighting heart, but a heart justified by faith, having peace with God, peace in himself, and peace with other people, peaceful heart, God's love established there, that is what God demands. And that's what God does for us by grace when we come to him. Number one, the possession of charity, that is God's love in a pure heart. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 5, now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. That word ench there means the goal and the reason and the purpose of the commandment. The fulfillment of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and the good conscience and of faith on vain. Of, of, of vain. That means on pretending faith, on hypocritical faith, real faith, proper faith, of faith, faith, the edge of the commandment, the purpose of the commandment, the effect of the commandment, and the result of the commandment in your life, in my life, is charity out of a pure heart. In Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, it says, Flee also youthful laws that tells us the Lord is not talking about the love, 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 the love of the flesh, the lusts of the flesh that uh, people in the world carry about, and all their entertainment is based on that. It said, Flee that one, flee also youthful laws, and but follow righteousness faith charity you see that charity then peace with them that call on the lord out of a pure heart this charity that the lord is emphasizing comes out of a pure heart it tells us in first peter chapter 1 verse 22 first peter chapter 1 Verse 22, it says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. There is no love without obedience. If we love God, we obey the truth he has taught us. If we love the Lord Jesus who died for us, we obey the truth he has emphasized and given to us. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, unpretending love of the brethren, a love that is proper, a kind of love that is profitable, unfeigned love of the brethren. See that she love one another with a pure heart. See that pure heart fervently. That pure heart is very important. Of the love that will manifest, we're told in Psalm 24, reading from verse 3, Psalm 24, verse 3, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? Hear the answer from the Lord himself in verse 4. He says, He that has clean hands and a pure heart, he that has clean hands and a pure heart, in connection with what we're studying today, he has charity out of a pure heart. He has love out of a pure heart. He has affection out of a pure heart. All the actions are the actions of love coming out of a pure heart who has not, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully we need to possess that 
And we cannot possess that with salvation. A definite experience of salvation. You'll know when you were saved. You'll know how you were saved. You'll know the message you heard that led you to repentance and conviction. And then you turned away from sin and believed on the Lord at a definite moment of time. Instantaneous work of grace in your heart. Your sins are forgiven. They are blotted out. And then you move on and you are sanctified. That sanctification too is a definite work of grace that the Lord performs forms in the heart and you approach the Adamic nature and you approach the natural selfishness in the heart of man and then it purifies your heart you are filled with charity and love and then you are on your way to heaven as you allow that love that charity that pure love that pure heart to continue with you in everything that you do number two number two is the primacy of God's love with a purposeful heart. You don't do anything without a purpose. If you are saying something and somebody asks you, why did you say that? You say, this is the purpose. If you are acting out something and somebody said, what's the purpose of that activity? You are able to tell this is the purpose and it is only when what you do is motivated by love and it has a purpose that glorifies God a purpose that helps people a purpose that shows you have the love of God in your heart that's why you are doing it to that person if it is not of love is condemned by the Lord it's if it is because of hatred, it's condemned by the Lord. If it's because of bitterness, it's condemned by the Lord. If it is because, uh, well, I need to show them uh, I'm not happy with them, uh, it's not recognized by God. Everything we do must have the purpose of divine love, God's love, charity, heaven's love in our heart. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 10, reading from verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee? The Lord thy God, thy God, you are saved. You're a member of the kingdom of God. You're a real child of God. Here is what the Lord requires of you now. If you live your life, you profess to be saved. You profess to be sanctified. You profess that you are a child of God. You are on your way to heaven. And you never care about what God requires from you. And you just act involuntarily. Reflex action. You were doing it before, so you are doing it now. You were talking like that before, so you are talking like that now. You were relating with people before like this, so you are doing it now. And there is a no purpose in your heart that I am doing this because God requires it of me. Then you are not conscious really, you are a child of God. It says now, what does the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, reverence him, respect him, and to walk in all his ways, not some of his ways, all his ways, all the time, and to love him, and to love him, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul. That's what he requests or requires in Matthew chapter 22. We're reading from verse 37. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. Jesus said unto him, Is Jesus your Savior? Jesus said unto him, Are you conscious of Jesus, the presence of Jesus, the desire of Jesus? Do you perceive? Here is what Jesus wants as my Savior, as my sanctifier, as the one that is taking me to heaven. Then you will pay attention. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love 
the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And then in verse 38, it says this, the first and great commandment. Now, if you do other things, but the love of God is not there, you have committed the first sin, first great sin, because you have not obeyed the first commandment. And you have sinned in the sight of the Lord, whatever your actions are, and whatever the prophet, humanly speaking, those actions may bring. If this first and great commandment is not observed by you to love the Lord in everything you do with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, all those things we do, they're useless. In verse 39, it says, And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Thou shalt love thy brother, thy sister as thyself. Thou shalt love thy husband, thy wife as thyself. Thou shalt love your friends as thyself. And even your neighbor, your enemy, thou shalt love everyone as yourself. And then in verse 40, it says, On these two commandments, love to God and love to your neighbor, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So if we interpret the Bible correctly, anything we read in the law of Moses, anything we read in the prophets, anything we read from Genesis to Malachi, this is going to be interpreted on the basis of love towards God and love towards man. Any other interpretation? that anybody gives. Sometimes somebody will read something in the Old Testament and they will say, look at this, because of this, I am justified to hate those who are not of my tribe. I am justified to hate the people I don't like. That's misinterpretation. Anything you interpret in the law and the prophets, the conclusion must be, I must love God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, and I must love my neighbor, my fellow man, as myself. Let's come to number three now. Number three, the perception of charity. God's love in a peaceful heart. We're coming to Colossians chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 14. It says, And above all these things, put on charity. After you run here and run there, after you have done some great activity, after you have spoken or preached some great message, after you have interacted with people one way or the other, it says, now that's all right. Above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. When it says put on, it says make it visible. When you put on clothes, we see the clothes you put on. Let us see the charity. Let us see the love, like we see the clothes that you put on. Let charity or divine love in your action, in your heart, in your life, in your communication, in your interaction, in your dealing with other people. That word dealing with other people, that means relating with other people. Don't ever have the mind, I will deal with him. When you talk like that, it means I forget love, I forget affection, I forget sympathy, I forget compassion, I forget every other thing I've learned, and you throw Genesis to Malachi and Matthew to Revelation, you throw that away, I will deal with him. When you do that, you are not a Bible-believing Christian. And you are not on your way to heaven. 
we must have the understanding that above all skill, above all knowledge, above all ability, above all, pro uh, all profession, above all possibilities, anything or everything you have done, and above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Look at verse 15, in verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. You understand that? Let the peace of God rule in your heart. You just heard something that somebody did or said about you. And then there is something on the inside. You want to rise up. I want to see him now. I want to confront him. And without the peace of God in your heart, without a restful spirit, a peaceful spirit, you want to jump on the situation. It says, don't allow that. Let be in control. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. If your heart is boiling, that's not the heart of Christ. If your heart is stirred up, that's not the heart of Christ. If your heart is uh, wanting to revenge and then already you are making your hand like you want to box everything out, that's not the love of God. In all that happened to Jesus Christ, we never heard any kind of impromptu action that he forgot himself. Don't forget yourself. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body. And be ye thankful. Philippians chapter 4, reading from verse 7. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, it says, And the peace of God which passeth understanding, the peace of God which passeth understanding. What does that mean? When something has happened and the normal expression and the normal action and the normal attitude is that you stand for your right and you stand for your good. That is, if I allow that, they'll ride on me. If I allow that, everybody will make a foot march out of me. If I allow that, they will think I, I'm not uh, courageous, I'm fearful. That's why they're doing that. Let the peace of God, which passes understanding, that nobody can understand. With thought, he'll get angry. With thought, he'll fight. With thought, he'll retaliate. With thought, it will speak back to them. With thought, it'll take the stone they threw at him and it will throw it back. The love of God in your heart brings the peace of God in your heart and that peace passes understanding. The people cannot understand how you can be peaceful at such a time like that. That's the evidence of grace in our heart. Let the peace and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, those things which that which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you when the god of peace is with you the peace of god will control everything in your life i pray that more and more the peace that passes understanding will control everything in our lives in jesus name point number two now number two is the purposelessness of charisma without love in the heart we refer to charisma as the gifts of the spirit and if somebody has the gifts of the spirit but there is no love in the heart it's purposeless it was even better the person did not have that gift that ability or that skill look at first corinthians chapter 13 verse 1 do i speak with the tongues of men and of angels, the gift of speaking diverse kinds of tongues. And I have no charity. I am become 
a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. You see that language? I am become. I am become. Before the tongues, before the gifts of the Spirit, when you just had the grace of God, you were all right. When you had godliness in your life, you were all right. But now, gift has come. Speaking in tongues has come. And the diverse kinds of tongues interpretation, they have come. Faith, power, authority has come. And now, pride comes in and he becomes a sounding brass and becomes a tinkling symbol. You know, there are people that before they add any power, any authority, any skill, any appointment, and before they were recognized, they were humble and they were loving and they were peaceful. You could easily relate with them, but now uh, the gifts have come power has come position has come authority has come and then they diagnose they go down on love there's no love anymore all they can think about now is the power and the position and the authority they have they become a sounding brass or a tinkling symbol. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, it tells us, And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. The people of the world and even the people in the church will count that person as brother somebody, prophet somebody, and preacher somebody, and pastor somebody. Why? He has the gift of prophecy. Why? He understands all mysteries. Why? He has all knowledge and then he has all faith and he can remove any mountain, every mountain. And yet, if he does not have charity, the love of God in the heart and his heart is bearing witness with him, you exercise power, you exercise authority, but there is deep-seated Antagonism, antagonism in your heart hatred animosity in your heart yes you manifest power like something yes you manifest power like a Balaam but there is no love in your heart your conscience tells you that then you brush it off and go your way and go for another demonstration of faith and then moving mountains if you don't have charity, all those things you do in the account of heaven, you are nothing. The three things we're looking at, number one, tongues without transparent love. Tongues without transparent love. Number two, prophetic proclamation without protective love. That he is a kind of love that wants to protect other people from danger. But there are people that have prophetic proclamation without protective love. Number three, mountain moving faith without the master's love, the Messiah's love. They do not have the love of the master in their heart. And yet, they have mountain moving faith. All that in the sight of God makes you nothing. You achieve nothing and you might miss heaven. If you do not come back and get on your knees and say, Lord, I need this divine love in my heart. Let's look at number one, tongues without transparent love. Already we have read that, and it says, uh, if I speak in the tongues of men and in the tongues of angels, and I do not have this divine love, God's love, preeminent love in my heart, I am become a sounding brass and a tinkling symbol. We're looking at James chapter 3, verse 1, my brethren. Be not many masters, 
don't be eager to be a preacher, eager to be a master, eager to be a teacher. Don't just push yourself forward. Why do you want to preach? Is it so I'll be like so and so? Or is it so that I can manifest the love of God out of my heart? Why do you want that position? Why do you want that authority? Is it so that I can do more good? I can help more people? I can show more love? I can demonstrate the compassion of God, the compassion of Christ in my heart? Or I want the position and the authority because of competition. He is doing it. I can do it too. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Receive the greater condemnation. There's no condemnation in heaven. If somebody receives the greater condemnation, that means he has missed heaven. Our tongue must be under control. If we love, you know, something instigates you, you want to talk about brother so and so, love will silence you. Don't talk like that. If he were here, will he see this as you loving him? Is this manifestation of love? If we don't have that love that controls our tongue, then we will not be profitable in the kingdom we might not even get to the eternal kingdom look at verse 5 in verse 5 even so the tongue is a little member and boasted great things and speaketh great things and proclaims great things there are people they think that talking 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 must be their full-time job they think that passing comment on everything that happens happens in society or whatever they read in the newspapers they think that passing comment a bad comment unfavorable go, uh, comment they think that is their full-time job and all those comments change nothing they don't show that you love you spend more time talking about people talking about society talking about this and that more time than you spend in prayer even so the tongue is a little member and boasted great things behold how great a matter a little fire can live some people burn down their families because of their tongue in verse 6 it tells us and the tongue is a fire a world of iniquity so is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body the tongue defileth the whole body what comes out of the tongue because it's not of love because it's not of charity, because it's not of divine love, the Lord sees that talkative as a defiled person. And if that person dies in that condition, always talking and talking, passing bad comments, criticizing, turning, tearing other people down, it's defiled. If he dies in that condition, a defiled man, woman, will not get to heaven with that defilement. It defiled the whole body and set it on fire, the cause of nature, and it is set on the fire of hell. It is set on the fire of hell. That's why we need to be very careful and we need to be very watchful that the grace of God will temper our tongue. The grace of God will transform our tongue. The grace of God will make our tongue transparently loving. Let's come to number two here. Number two, prophetic proclamation without protective love. Without protective love. Do you ever think of protecting other people, other people's interests, other people's lives? other people's feelings other people's progress do you have love enough 
that you are protecting others rather than protecting yourself. There are people, they are into self-defense every time. They do something that needs some correction. They do something you know, that needs the control and the influence of love. But they are not thinking about that. They are ready to give a reason for what they have done. They are not protecting other people in love. They are only protecting themselves. And they are protecting the evil that they do. It tells us in First Corinthians chapter 13 verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and yet they don't use that knowledge, that prophecy, the understanding of mysteries to protect the gospel, protect the gospelers, protect people around them, they just they shout whatever. The Lord wants us to have love that will protect others from danger. And we're looking at uh, Numbers chapter 24. And we're reading from verse 15. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Baal, I said, and the man whose eyes are open have said, then in verse 16, he has said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but his eyes open, having his eyes open. In verse 17, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not now. There shall be, there shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. Then in verse 18, and Edom shall be a possession, Seir also shall be a possession for the enemies and Israel shall do valiantly. Verse 19, out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion and shall destroy him that remaineth in the city. Great prophecy that Balaam had, but because he had not the love of the master, that he prophesied about, he had the love of money. Therefore, he counseled Balak how he will make the children of Israel to, fo to form, and then God will be angry with them. Look at Revelation chapter 2. We're reading from verse 14. Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Balaam taught Balak how to make the children of Israel sin. Now, it says that church that Christ spoke to had some among them there teaching others to fall, teaching others to commit sin. They remained there in the congregation of the righteous and then they are influencing, they are instigating, they are counseling, they are talking to other people to do things that will that is calculated to make others fall. They might have gifts, they might be able to do all that and do it so efficiently that their people that they are teaching, like Balaam taught 
Balak to make Israel fall, they may do it effectively, but obviously they do not have the love of God in their hearts. And whatever their influence, and whatever their effectiveness, and whatever the control they have on the lives of people that will do things like that, that influence will not end them heaven. They will perish like Balaam perished. That's why the Lord is telling us, gifts are not enough. Charisma is not enough. We must have the love that protects other people from sinning, protect other people from provocation, protect other people from evil. Matthew chapter 7, we're reading from verse 21. Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. What's the will of the Father? That you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. What's the will of the Father? That you love your brother love your sister love your neighbor love members of the church love everyone whether they are ministers or members love them as you love yourself and you have protection in your vocabulary of love in your attitude of love you have protection of other people in your action of love it says in verse 22 it says many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works? You see all those things there? They're not enough to get to heaven. They're not enough to earn us a place in heaven. In verse 23, it says, And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Graceless life. I never knew you. Loveless life. I never knew you. Purposeless life. I never knew you. They did not prepare for heaven. They just settled at speaking in tongues and prophecies, understanding all mysteries. They just settled that charisma without charity. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Let's look at number three now. Number three is mountain moving faith without the master's law. Mountain moving faith without the master's love. You understand? There are many people who are running out of faith, 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 faith to do this, faith to climb that, faith to achieve that, and faith to uphold this, and faith to move every mountain, and faith to heal, and faith to cast out devils, and faith to deliver. And the Lord is saying that, that is not enough. If you fast and pray, so you can have mountain moving faith. Do you fast as much to have this indispensable love of God in your heart? What's the purpose? Why are you fasting? Why are you praying? Why are you seeking God? Why are you reading this and reading that? So you can have faith, mountain moving faith, when you understand you are deficient in love. You are deficient in thinking about the needs of other people. You are deficient and you are void of having the progress of other people at that. Why don't you go on your knees? Why don't you do all the search you are making for faith and all the denial you are having for faith, all the fasting you are doing for faith? Why don't you do that so you can have this more important thing that the love of Christ will reign in your heart. Though I have this verse two now, the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith, all kinds of faith, great faith, 
mountain moving faith, um, tree approaching faith, and the faith to do this and the faith to do that. Though I have all kinds of faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, that's possible. Faith without love, that's possible. Miracles without mercy, that's possible. Healing other people without having honest heart to relate and deal with other people, that's possible. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. He wants us to have the kind of love the master had. He tells us in John chapter 14, reading from verse 15, John chapter 14, reading from verse 15, if he love me, keep my commandments. Do you ever think of the commandments of Christ? What he told us to do, and he told us to do that out of love. He tells us in verse 23, in verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words. Are you conscious of those words anytime? Anytime there is an enemy that throws something at you, do you remember the words of Jesus Christ? What you are to do? Anytime you are persecuted and you feel the pain and the pang of the persecution, do you remember the words of Jesus? How you are to be glad in that day and rejoice for that persecution, for great is your reward in heaven. Anytime there's somebody in need is before you, what you are to do. Do you remember the words of Jesus? How to care for the poor. That's what the Lord is saying. He's saying, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. In verse 24, he tells us in verse 24, He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sins. He may use my name to heal the sick. If he does not keep my sins, he does not love me. He may use my name to say, I'm a Christian, I belong to Christ, I'm on my way to heaven, Jesus died on the cross for me. If he does not keep my sins, he does not love me. He may use my name before other believers to get something out of them. He's only using Christ, he's not serving Christ, and he's not manifesting love to Christ. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sins. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Let's come to number uh, three now. Point number three is the preference of Christ-likeness with love in our hearts. The preference of Christ-likeness with love in our hearts. We're looking at First Corinthians chapter 13. We're reading from verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, very generous, and though I give my body to be born, very zealous, and have not charity, it profited me nothing. You know what the Lord is telling us? We can copy the actions of other people. What they did out of love. We can copy those actions, but there's no love in our demonstrating the actions we copy. The early church, some of them sold their possession and they gave everything for the care of other people that were poor. And then somebody can copy that. They did that in Acts chapter 2. They did that in Acts chapter 4. So now I'm going to do that too. It is not the action. It's the affection behind, beneath the action. Somebody may read about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
how they gave themselves to the furnace of Nebuchadnezzar. And they said, we're going to obey God. We're not going to worship any other God. And they did that out of their love for God. Somebody may not have the love that salvation brings to their heart. He may not have the love that sanctification brings to their heart. And then he sets himself on fire. He's zealous for religion. And he gives his body to be born. And yet there's no love. He dies in that body. He dies in that condition. And he goes to hell because giving yourself to be born for religion without birth of regeneration does not earn you heaven. The preference, the preference of Christ likeness with love in our hearts. Three things. Number one, the insufficiency of sacrificial giving without saving grace. Number two, the implication of burning for religion without birth through redemption. Number three, the indispensability of sincere graciousness with spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts should go along with the gracious, sincere, loving attitude relationship we have with other people. Let's look at number one. The insufficiency of sacrificial giving without saving grace. And let's look at um, 2 Kings chapter 10 verse 16. 2 Kings chapter 10 verse 16. And he said, this is Jehu saying to Jonadab, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride in his chariot, zealous for the Lord. He was going to stamp out Baal worship in the land. But then he used deception. He used unrighteousness. He went through the path of iniquity. He thought the end justifies the means. They can practice transgression. They can practice lying. They can practice dishonesty. And they say, I have a good purpose. I'm driving at this. That's what Jehu did. But look at verse 31. The comment in verse 31. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. For he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. If we just have the action, but there's no affection and there's no love, we take care, we give good things, we give sacrificially, we give money, but the purpose is not of love. It's because you're seeking something for yourself. That person will not have the commendation of heaven that he was expecting. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the, into the kingdom of heaven. All the good things we do, if they're going to earn the favor and the commendation of heaven, must be out of love. Let's look at number two. Number two, the implication of burning for religion without the new birth through redemption or regeneration. In John chapter 3, reading from verse 3, John chapter 3 verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, a philanthropic person who is a great giver 
cannot just come into the midst of the people of God and say, I saw that need and he feels the need. I see that problem. He solves the problem. He sees, uh, you know, that connection. He makes the connection. He's giving everything he can give. When it comes to zeal, he will endanger his life so that he can be in the forefront and get this done. The only problem is he has not really been born again. He has not given his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives hands to the Lord. He gives feet to the Lord. He can run. He gives mind and head to the Lord. He can reason and plan, but he has not given his heart to the Lord. He doesn't have the heart of love, and he doesn't feel that love. He doesn't see the importance of that love. Only action, action, activity, activity, and he's you know moving everywhere, pursuing. Her. They know him there. They know her there. They know her everywhere. Yeah, but the love of God is not in the heart, in the private. He will not live the life of a born again believer. But in the public, it's all action, all action. We need salvation and the love of God in our heart before all that running around. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I pray none of us will serve in vain in Jesus' name. I will not serve in vain. You will not serve in vain in Jesus' name. Number three now, in number three, the indispensability of sincere graciousness with spiritual gifts. Before you manifest the gifts, be gracious. Let the love of Christ be in your heart that you are gracious to children, you are gracious to the weak, you are gracious to the lowly, you are gracious to the women, you are gracious to the men, you are gracious to those who are downtrodden, you are gracious in your language, you are gracious in your comportment, you are gracious in your action. You are very thoughtful. You will not want to hurt anybody. You'll not hurt the fearful. You'll not hurt the feeble. You'll not hurt the fainting. You want to be gracious in everything you do and in every action of your hand. You want to be gracious every time in small things and great things. And then you can bring your gift to the fold because grace is there gift can now follow and gift can now do what you ought to do with the grace of god and the graciousness you see without the graciousness gift is vain gift will oppress other people gift will have a kind of self impose you'll impose yourself on people if the grace of god is not there if the love of god is not there it will be gift 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 i want to manifest my gift i want to show my gift if i'm going to be a part of that church they must allow me to come out and stand on that chair and stand in that place and manifest my gift if there is no way to manifest my gift manifest graciousness manifest love manifest affection and manifest humility and manifest Christ living in you and you are talking like Christ and you are helping like Christ you don't want to be Judas Iscariot only having office only having position and yet the graciousness of love is not there sincere graciousness is indispensable with the manifestation of spiritual gifts we're coming to first corinthians chapter 13 and we're reading from verse 3 and though i bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though i give all my body to be burnt and have not charity have not christ-like love 
have not gracious love have not affection sympathy for other people have not charity it profited me nothing look at first first peter chapter 4 reading from verse 10 first peter chapter 4 verse 10 as every man has received the gift the gift so even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Gift at the beginning of the verse, grace at the end of the verse, the grace and the gift must work together. Graciousness in your lifestyle, and then you can manifest the gift because you have love in your heart. In verse 11, in verse 11 it says, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. It says, we do all things to the glory of God. You cannot hate for the glory of God. You cannot oppress other people to the glory of God. You cannot possess other people and put them in your pocket for the, for the glory of God. If you are possessive and you always want to control other people's lives, you don't care whether they appreciate it or not. You don't care whether that lifts them up or not, encourages them or not. You just want to possess them and put them in your pocket. That's not law. Release the people. Let everyone have the liberty and the freedom to serve God and serve God acceptably. If you love people, you will not possess them. You will not tie them up. You will not uh, control them to the point they don't have any mind of their own anymore. Love shows in our graciousness and sincerity to other people. And then uh, you manifest your gift. I manifest my gift. And we all do it in the graciousness that the Lord has given. That's how we should love, manifest love. There will be profit, there will be progress in our lives. And then we'll have the unshakable hope of heaven. In Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 7. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace. Is giving grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. The grace is there and the gift is there. The sincere graciousness is there and the spiritual gift is there. In verse 11, it says, and it gives some apostles, but they must have graciousness with their gifts. He gives some prophets. They must have love with the gifts they manifest and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And then in verse 12, he tells us the purpose for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And then in verse 13, until we all come, until we all come to the unity of the faith. Well, the church has not all come to the unity of the faith. There are babes, there are infants, and there are growing people, there are mature people, there are immature people. The love must continue. The graciousness must continue and the impartation into the lives of other people must continue until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God 
unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. First Corinthians chapter 16, we're reading from verse 13. First Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. And now verse 14 says, let all your things be done with charity. Everything you do, anything you do, in any place, at any time, inside, outside, anything you say, anything you act out, let the love of God, the love of Christ, control your tongue, influence your hands, influence your feet, influence your conversation, influence everything, every time, at all costs. Let all things be done with charity, with God's love, with Christ-like love. Let all your things be done with charity. Amen. Amen. The Lord confirmed that in every life in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and take everything we've learned to the Lord in prayer. The Lord has spoken to us on something important, something preeminent, something that must be prominent in our lives. And it is charity, the God kind of love. The God kind of love. Examine your heart. Examine your life. Examine your past actions, examine your performance, examine yourself and find out, do you do everything in love, agape love, heaven kind of love, God's kind of love, Christ's kind of love? Are you saved? If you are saved, the testimony of that salvation shall come out from the love in your action and the love in your disposition. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. Tell the Lord to help you that this indispensable love will be established in your heart that you will offer reasonable service unto the Lord. Service without love is unreasonable. Activity without love is unacceptable. Behavior that doesn't have love and affection at the root of it does not show salvation saved by grace then graciousness will come in is your heart devoid of love empty of love do you act like the natural man? No grace, no salvation, no transparency, no love. Are you satisfied without the love of Christ in your heart? Religion without love. Churchianity without love. Zeal without love. Running up and down without love. Talk, talk, talk. Conversation. Counseling. Advising. Trying to make other people do this, influence without love. Tell the Lord. And if your heart 
is a heart of hatred, animosity, malice, grumbling, harsh words, hardness of heart, hardness of life. You don't feel for the people that suffer as a result of your action. Salvation is not there. We're saved by grace through faith. And grace will demonstrate and manifest love. Grace will demonstrate graciousness, affection. Examine yourself to know whether you are in the faith or not. If you're in the faith, there'll be love, there'll be affection, there'll be graciousness. We must possess the love of God in the heart. He saves us and implants the love of heaven in our hearts. He sanctifies us, uproots cell depravity, self-centeredness, uproots that away from our hearts and makes us to possess the love of God. And the love of God becomes primary in our heart. The primacy of that love in your heart. That the first consideration in everything you do, does this reflect the love of God? He sees you. He knows you. He evaluates your action. By him, actions are waged. Is love the primary, premier thing in your life? Is it the number one consideration? As the Lord that he will help you. That's the purpose of the study, the benefit of the study, that you'll not continue just acting habitually without the refreshing love of God in your heart. Perception of love, charity, a peaceful heart. Are you peaceful or pugnacious? Always looking for a reason to fight? Looking for a reason to strive? You have rest in your mind, peace in your heart? And do you follow this peace and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord? Are you peaceful in your heart? Or contentious in your heart striving in your heart have you forgotten how to live at peace with the brethren peace language peace not a language or conversation that will provoke other people to striving and fighting peace with those who are close to you, those who are dear to you, peace with the people who serve you and the people you are serving, peace the perception of charity that other people can perceive, other people can tell other people can see because it is visible, tell the Lord. 
tongues, 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 without love, talk, 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 without love. You're eager to talk. Hear me, hear me, hear me. Slow now. Shut up a little. Bring love in the heart. Transparent love. Now the person you are talking to, always wanting to give advice, advice, counseling, let them see the love first. Transparent love in your heart. Prophecy. How to prophesy. How to prophesy. You have protective love that protects other people. Do protect the feeling of other people, joy of other people. Do you protect the desires of other people? We know you can talk. We know you can proclaim. Are you possessive? You want to possess other people, control other people. You want the high and the low to always be under your authority, possessive, controlling, imprisoning other people. There's no love there. Release the people. Let them have the freedom that they ought to have as children of God. Don't be that possessive. They're always thinking control, control, subdue, conquer other people. There's no love there. You injure the people you possess. Show love. Let them have the joy of being themselves. If they are not saved, the action will show. So you don't have to compel them to act saved. If they are saved, the actions will show. You don't have to compel them, possess them. Let there be love that protects other people's interests. The master's love, not just mountain moving faith. If you add all faith, to remove mountains and you don't have the love of the master it's vain it's nothing Christ likeness is indispensable that's why you became a Christian to live like Christ behave like Christ move like Christ love like Christ. Sacrificial giving without saving faith will not be recognized in heaven. Burning was zeal for religion without the new birth of redemption, regeneration is nothing. Examine yourself and see where you stand. Graciousness. Every time, graciousness. Not just giftedness, graciousness. Action, interaction, behavior, lifestyle, graciousness. Talking to other people, 
relating with other people, graciousness. Then the gifts can come. Let grace be at the foundation of everything, grace surrounding everything, grace influencing everything. Let your salvation influence everything you do in life. In Jesus' name, we pray. An amen of renewed love. Yeah. Father, we thank you for this hour. We thank you for what we have learned. We are praying, Lord, everything we have heard, everything we have learned will become practical, purposeful, pungent, penetrating in every heart. In Jesus' name, yeah. we pray that all things we do, everywhere we go, every action we manifest all things will be done out of the love of christ the love of god the love of the commandments of god and the love of the brethren and the love for sinners in jesus name and we pray that your love will grow in every heart those who have examined themselves and have seen that they do not have the salvation that is necessary to bring in love in their hearts, O oh Lord, in your mercy and love, save them in Jesus' name. And those who have realized they need a second touch and a second work of grace and the sanctifying experience in their heart that will bring perfect love towards God and towards Christ and towards the scriptures, perfect love towards the brethren. Do that second work of grace in every heart in Jesus' name. As we go back home, when we get back home, O oh Lord, remind us that we will get on our knees again and have great love, manifold love, overflowing love, saturating, penetrating love in every heart in Jesus' name. And Lord, we pray when the time comes for you to take us home, you'll find love and faith and hope in every heart in Jesus' name show your love more to everyone and impart your love more in everyone that our fellowship our assembly our interaction will be of love more and more in jesus name we well, thank you because we know you have answered in jesus name we pray amen, amen.